Hi, I'm Somia, and you're listening to Philosopreneur, where we explore the intersection and integration of the philosopher and entrepreneur. My very first guest is Abir Desai. Abir is a world adventurer. He has a BS in economics from NYU and an MA in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness from CIIS. He was a commissioned infantry officer and ex boot camp instructor of the Singapore Armed Forces. His first job after finance school was supporting microeconomies in rural India and thereafter pursued the creative life of an abstract expressionist painter. Currently, he is mapping the past and shaping the future with his macro predictive technology company, Numinous Realm. I hope you enjoy this very first episode of Philosopreneur. Hi, Abir. Thank you for joining me today for this dialogue on uh, philosophernership. So I guess I want to just start by asking, um, what does philosophy mean to you? Yeah, I think that's a big question. I think we were talking about that just earlier today. What is philosophy? I think philosophy is a way of life. That's what I think it is. I know that there's an academic subject called philosophy in the quote-unquote ivory tower, not trying to knock academia and that whole lineage of studying philosophy formally, but I do think philosophy can be taken out of the mind into more of the body, of which culture is a part of the bodies which hold us, you know? I even think the way that different plants grow, like a moss versus a vine versus a tree, indicate different kinds of philosophies i would say um i think you were saying it's a love of wisdom which is the technical definition i guess the etymology but that's my sense of philosophy i think it's a it's a it's a way of movement it's it's how spirit moves through matter i would say Hmm. interesting i like that and what about entrepreneurship what does entrepreneurship mean to you yeah, that's that's super interesting because I also think entrepreneurship is the way that that uh, spirit and matter interplay, right? Um, generally, I've lived in a multipolar world where art is there, commerce is there, science is there. All of these are different paradigms, um, which have their own hierarchies, right? But more recently, I've begun to feel that maybe spirit is actually or spirituality is actually at the top and I think philosophy can be a kind of engagement with spirit so what is entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is creating patterns that are sustainable um, using financial uh, foundation I mean there's something about entrepreneurship which does seem to involve money or commerce currency exchange and patterns so I always think of like a Starbucks where you walk in there's a certain vibe there's a certain spirit every coffee um, shop has a different feeling Starbucks has a certain feeling um, so the, the experience what you're getting the price you're paying it uh, there's a there's a worldview there there's a philosophy there but I think it took this act of entrepreneurship mm-hmm. to excavate that truth which is now sustainable and it's because it's spread and everybody participates in it yeah that's interesting from the way you're you're describing both the terms or it seems like uh philosophy has a bit more of a um aloneness quality to it and entrepreneurship feels more as part of the world in community you're always engaging with people as you said participation but that word for in in when you we when you were describing philosophy uh, that didn't come up, you know, so it, it, you said it's a way of life which seems a little bit more concentrated on the self hmm. versus entrepreneurship seems to be more focused on um, on the whole community. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I appreciate your perspective. I just want to yeah. explore that, you know, so I work with archetypal psychology. Mm-hmm. So there's this sense of solar and lunar qualities so when you talk about a community i immediately think of a lunar relationship and the individual is a solar individual journey um i there's also this 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 feeling of eastern and western emerging uh where i'm thinking of in the west a scholar 
in their room writing, but in dialogue. I think every philosopher has been in dialogue with philosophers from the past, in dialogue with the world around them. Um, but generally, I think in the West, there has been in the past 300 years an emphasis on the solar individual journey. Uh, somehow in the East, this is not totally fair, but it's just the feeling coming up is that sense of like monks in a monastery all together, you know? Um, so I do think philosophy can be very lunar. Obviously it is. One is in dialogue with the entire world, the entire cosmos to create. Um, entrepreneurship can also be very solar, individual. I'm also thinking about lean startup kind of approach, which is super emphasizing like customer feedback cycles versus a more fine art kind of artist or luxury mm. industry, which is a bit more focused on an authority figure, a solar identity, like the brand like Chanel is on top of the entire hierarchy. It's at, at the center, so it communicates, you know. Mm. Um, so I think there's always so much, everything, there's a fractal like quality to the everything exists in everything. At the same time, we want to try to differentiate, you know, what is philosophy, what is entrepreneurship. So I think, yeah, I think it's an excavation that's under, <laughs> underway. Yeah, I find that really interesting and and you bring up, you know, the luxury market, which um, I'm forgetting the author, uh, but I think the book is called The Luxury Strategy, where they talk about how, um, you know, luxury brands don't focus on what their customer wants. They don't, they don't, they don't integrate customer feedback, and they, they, they pretty much kind of project their own philosophy onto the world, right? So how, why is it that that such a vision of business such as like you know if we let's 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 imagine chanel you know why is it that it's such a successful company but then at the same time you have someone like elon musk with tesla who's integrating customer feedback all the time is also as successful yeah well to be fair i do recall elon musk remarking that for the cyber truck mm -hmm. they did not go through a big customer feedback thing for the design which I think is amazing. Honestly, I really feel like the design really hit the zeitgeist. I mean, I don't know when was it announced, 2018 or 20, you know, again, I, I work with, I work with psychology, uh, archetypal psychology, which eventually becomes astrology. And so I'm always looking at how outer planets are lining up and what's come. I don't have to get into all of that right now, you know, um, but I do think uh, even authority figures like Chanel kind of a company is taking the feedback of the world, but they're just not necessarily asking everybody. Mm -hmm. Maybe today, because it's such a huge business, it is, you know. But even uh, if you were to ask people, hey, tell me what you want, sometimes people don't know what they want. Yeah. And, just, you know, Steve Jobs, big proponent of that sense that uh, people don't always, you know, people don't always know what they want until they get it also. Mm -hmm. So there is this sense of, Giving, I think, is also important there as a company or as a creative. You're giving to a community. And sometimes you ask people what they want and they tell you something that's not true. And sometimes you don't ask them and you give them something that immediately connects. So there's an alchemy, I think, to hmm. to being successful in the world or something like that, being hmm. creative. Hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. So in some sense, the philosopher is has a bit more authority. Which I, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to see your point of view on this. If we think about the luxury uh, company, there's a sense of the philosopher putting their worldview and saying, okay, look, this is, this is what you want. This is what you need in life to feel happy. And then there's the entrepreneur who's like, wait a moment. I think I want to understand what life actually wants from me and attempts to build that. Maybe there's another way of looking at it as though like the philosopher, the philosopher is asking the question, and the entrepreneur is is attempting to make the to build or manifest the answer. Say that again. The philosopher is asking the question, and the entrepreneur is manifesting the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I think. Uh, I think what's amazing about free market democratic capitalism is how the raw intensity with which different communities can try to outcompete each other uh, which is very destructive creative destruction but it can also create a tremendous amount of excellence 
I was just thinking about the new Harry Potter game which came out, Hogwarts Legacy. And I was just like, wow, these team is competing with every other game, every other film, every other activity a person could do. Uh, they're competing with all of those. So they have to make an amazing experience to convince 10 people, 100 people, hundreds of thousands of people to give you know an hour, 10 hours, a month of their life to experience this thing you know so I think it's amazing in this again like free market democratic capitalistic with regulation society because even government is part of that balance you know that mm -hmm. you have an amazing lineage of Swiss watchmakers in Europe then suddenly a company in California Apple comes along from the tech world nothing to do with clock making and creates a product that mm. eats away at that market and then you have apple has invested billions of dollars to create an amazing camera smartphone and then you have some gen z kids who are like i don't even like my pictures to look super sharp i want blurry pictures yeah. i'm gonna go back to the star tac phone or whatever the from the 90s phones. the yeah. flip phones so like it's like culture attacking uh you know tech tech attacking business business being attacked by government blah 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 like there's just this ceaseless churning which i think is is just how the cosmos is and i do think this free market democratic capitalistic regulated system is is it just creates enough room for that that magmic intensity at the heart of the cosmos to like keep generating out mm. beautiful i like that yeah um there's a lot of points here we can we can we can continue to open up and before that i think i would like to just you know, ask more about your journey into both areas and then perhaps how both come together. So maybe we can start with your journey into philosophy. Yeah. So I was in the army in Singapore and uh, feeling kind of alone out there because I, I had not really lived in Singapore much since I was a kid. I had to be there. And on the weekends, I would just kind of roam around the city you know and listen to music in the record shop and browse the bookstores and I think that's where I first began to come across these kind of interesting books uh, one was by Irvin Laszlo uh, I forget the title but later I realized he was a major figure in the integral or uh, yeah I guess is it the integral movement or just this kind of not integral as in Wilbur but more like uh, you know um, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and Stan Groff and that whole world, you know, transpersonal kind of world. Found one of his books, found another book that was all about different thought experiments, The Pig Who Wants to Be Eaten. It was just like filled with a lot of thought experiments. Came across a book by uh, Yogananda, the famous book on uh, autobiography of a yogi. So these were different things that I just came across. I think music has also, also evoked a sense of wonder. And then I went to college, you know, for, for business and found an, an entire, you know, consciousness opening up within me that was not really being addressed by this Wall Street world, which I was in when I was in college. The Great Recession was happening and I had a lot of questions about what commerce capitalism were. Uh, and uh, so I, I kind of, I feel like I checked out or I dropped out, honestly, while I was mid-flight of my program, I just... You know, I was still in the program and I still graduated, but my momentum was pulling me somewhere else. It took me to a, a village in South India. I was working with Sudarshan Maini, one of India's great entrepreneurs, who was also a very spiritual man. Every morning he would meditate, he would pray. I had a lot of opportunity to dialogue. He uh, made the Reva uh, electric vehicle in India, one of the first mass produced electric cars. One of India's great industrialists actually lived in his house, dialogued with him. Um, so those were some of the stepping points, uh, you know, I think uh, the 12 step community also was a big part of finding a spirituality which was very um, robust and durable, usable, not like in some book, but in the world, uh, 12 steps like uh, AA or different programs like that where you had people from all walks of life finding their own spirituality, what it meant to them. That was a big revelation for me. Uh, and of course the PCC program. Um, and along the way, I was like a working in marketing, marketing strategy. I had a 
a consulting company. I had um, uh, did work with a tech company in Silicon Valley. So different things like that along the way were, I guess, um, feeding the philosophy and the business side. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's you've been on quite a spiritual journey, I would say. Yeah, I wanted to mention the painting too. I think three, four years painting while I was in grad school also. Um, but yeah, I think that just takes me to the to the moment here. It just feels like it's all there. There's just this feeling, this desire to be in the world and then to be out of the world and to just keep seeking the mystery and then you find a bit of a mystery and then you try and make meaning from it and then yeah. you need more mystery. That's how So would you say your pull towards philosophy was always the sense of seeking the mystery like was that your pull or was there some other underlying like like why am i here or you know you mentioned uh 12 step so um i don't know if you want to go into that but what was there something deeper that was like pulling you in this direction or was it just very fundamental on an on like this mysterious pull of yeah. what you know existential feeling of what it means to be human yeah i remember being in college you know uh you know or, or having a you know a, a journey with friends and um basically i remember there being a big question in my mind that had no answer i mean that's what that experience gave me you know it was just like this sense of um what is that question i mean there was like there was this question in my mind but i just didn't even know what the question was seeking and i think when I threaded back many years before then, that's what I felt in Singapore too. It was just a, a question I had, but I didn't really even know what the question was. It was just a movement. But now with an archetypal psychology approach, I can see that as a kind of plutonic id. I mean, there was just this plutonic, intense feeling to uncover or to go deeper. Uh, and that book by Jack Kerouac, On the Road, mm. I think really carries that spirit of searching without even necessarily knowing yeah. where it will lead you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, you mentioned PCC, so for just for our audience, that, that stands for Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. Uh, it's a program out of uh, San Francisco's California Institute of Integral Studies, and that is where we met in our master's program. I don't know if you want to touch on that a little bit because that seems to have uh, been a big part of your philosophical journey I mean it's in the in the degree itself you know it's a philosophy degree and uh, what led you there um, and and yeah 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 um, so I had a great friend in college uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth goes by bit hardest working student I ever met was always in the library great friend um, uh, you know, and uh, I think she could sense that I was on this quest to know more. And when I came back from the village and I was writing, I started writing a book, uh, 80,000 words on basically psychology, because it was just like, I just wanted to share the experiences I was having and to help any person have a sense of like the different parts within ourselves. Now I see it's kind of archetypal psychology that I was writing about, but it was inspired by all the different brew that I was into at the time. Um, Eckhart Tolle did inspire me at that time, and you know, Twelve Step also. Uh, lots of different things. This whole this whole thread. Um, but she she saw that and she was like, yeah, maybe you could be a therapist. And there's this great program in CIIS, and she herself was considering going there. And she's this insanely hardworking student who could go to any college anywhere, and did I think do like many gra graduate programs and. So through her, I found out about this PsyD program to become a counseling, th uh, to be a psychologist, doctor of psychology. Looked at that program because CIIS is like a mecca for transpersonal psychology. So bringing spirituality into Western academia. I mean, that's where it happens and been happening for several decades. Many of the founders of that school were the pioneers of the 60s spiritual movement that America and the entire planet got you know this modern sense of spirit uh so that's where i found the pcc program just stumbled across the website and one of the, the happiest accidents i would say in my life nice wonderful uh well i mean you did mention a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey but perhaps we can go into that a little bit more as well and like 
you know, I mean, I think the sense of uh, entrepreneurship, startups, you know, blew up uh, pretty significantly in the past, like since you know maybe around 07 all this this whole like 12 year decade um a little bit over a decade now uh you know the whole startup scene blew up everyone wants to be an entrepreneur and um uh, i just want to get a sense for what your journey has been like what what inspired you to be, be an entrepreneur um and where has it brought you so far yeah i don't want to get too technical but uh You know, I do astrology with outer planets. And so we had an alignment from 2007 to 2020, which was a Uranus-Pluto alignment. Don't have to get into the weeds about that. But basically the 2010s were this very raw time for everybody. Strong focus on being who you are, being real, being yourself, bucking the trend, not getting stuck in systems of other people whether you're an influencer, whether you're a founder, everybody was a CEO, everybody was a founder, everybody was an influencer. Mm-hmm. And some influencers, some startups, some you know, people rose up to be more influential than the institutions of the day. You know, Like you had random Instagram accounts that were more relevant than Vogue magazine was you know, uh, for some period of time and and then many of them became the institution themselves you know so there was this feeling in me i would say it's part of that philosophical quest that desire to be on the road a friend gave me on the road when i was studying abroad in london and that really opened up this intense feeling because this was like sophomore year of college so freshman year i was like a good stern kid nyu stern wall street feeder school wearing suits all the time how to tie a tie you know all of that going to networking events i mean very interesting i wanted to be part of that world because when i was in the army i felt so stuck Mm -hmm. and i saw some man and with his friend walk in to a hotel because i used to sit in the hotel lobby in singapore the swiss hotel or some hotel just having a drink you know wishing i could be free and i saw two men walk in with navy blue suit and a rolly backpack and i was like and like they look so free you know they probably just <laughs> flew in from somewhere to this hotel and they'll fly out tomorrow and i was stuck there for two years um great time but it was a time where i felt a bit like i had to be stuck there you know mm. so it was a sense of freedom that took me to business school but then the great recession started happening and then my friend gave me on the road and then dubstep music also started to become a bigger part of my world which was a pretty big part um, for several years there. Just that feeling, that libidinal release, you know, or libidinal unleashing, liberation, I would say, which jazz music has carried, rock and roll has carried. That was my encounter with dubstep. Later, some rap musicians as well. I think Kanye West really did an amazing job of carrying that in the 2010s. So these were some of the things that, um, uh, yeah, just, just just drove me to want to do my own thing in life, make my own mark, not get absorbed into J.P. Morgan, which is where you know I was going to go work after college. Um, amazing bank. I mean, my admiration for J.P. Morgan Chase and Jamie Dimon has only increased over time. But I just felt like there was a larger destiny, which I think many people have that experience. Maybe all young people do, but I think the 2010s were especially about shaking it up. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's cool. I like I like that a lot. Um, so, what what is it that you know you're you do currently? Yeah, so I'm an astrologer. You know, I have many friends sometimes who say you're like you're much more than an astrologer. Um, you know, that's not if you say astrologer to somebody immediately they just they have a certain perception that maybe I'm writing horoscopes for the newspaper or something like that you know <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm what you call an industrial astrologer you know uh, is, is one way I describe it uh, the reason I use the word industrial is to purposefully try and mash up this sense of astrology which is often very personal uh, you know I'm giving you a reading I'm looking at your natal chart and really bringing it to a more uh, macro scale which is completely all my training, everything comes from PCC, Richard Tarnas, and the amazing community of fellow astrologers, students, and uh, mentors that I've had. I mean, just everything I am today is because of the people I learned it from. But at this time, I'm taking that astrology and doing something that's not so different from what I would say 
a macro hedge fund would do, except they are probably working with more material statistical data based on the Newtonian Cartesian paradigm, which they grew up in, we all grew up in, which has been there for the past 300, 400 years, basically somehow feeling like if it cannot be measured in a laboratory, then it's not real. Now, that doesn't act adequately describe the complexity of the world we live in today and all the thought leaders like Sheldrake and whoever else. I mean, there's so many people out there pushing the edge mm. as artists, as scientists. Um, but that would that, that sense of um, taking astrology and applying it to the, the macro structures of things like financial markets, and fashion, the fashion world. So it's very interesting to note that uh, fashion, like every other industry, that's impacted by psychology, individual and collective psychology, like financial markets, like fashion, like politics, uh, all of them have some correlation actually, pretty pronounced in many cases to at least the outer planets, which mm -hmm. is what I study, right? So I look at Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and then I look at the alignment between those, and then based on hundreds of years of documented evidence from Richard Tarnas, there's a basic foundation there that I myself have spent many years building upon to create a kind of engine that's integrating all of this data from different sources, different third-party historical sources, and using that to predict the future. So the same way any hedge fund is trying to predict the future, any fashion brand is to some extent trying to predict and shape the future. Mm. Uh, I do a similar work on a smaller scale, pre-funded, just bootstrapped at this point, research oriented, um, but with some experiments, explorations into weaving commerce into this kind of a prediction. That's what I do. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it sounds um, very complex and it, it, it does seem uh, like you are um, embodying the sense of a philosopher and um, if you can just maybe touch on how that unfolds in your work like where where does how do you mesh or entangle the philosophical with the entrepreneur with the entrepreneurial side what is is there is there even a, a s sort of a schism I don't know if that's the right word but or if there's a separation between the two um, because I think right now the, the, the term philosopher is just really emerging and uh, as I embody it, as I try to embody it, it feels like there's a separation between the two. It's like I'm in philosopher mode right now and then I'm in entrepreneurial mode um, or, you know, attempting to be. Uh, so I want, I just want to hear from you what, how that comes through because it seems like you're dealing with a very philosophical system you know, astrology and, um, a par you know, paradigm shifts. Um, maybe, yeah, you could just touch on that. Yeah. Well, I would say, like, you are a, a light of what philosopher is. You know, to me, I feel like it's a word that you brought into my awareness and you have really carried. Uh, I remember I lost my Apple Pencil and then I was using your Apple Pencil for... <laughs> A month or two months and you have like philosopher inscribed on it and I would look at that term and it would what it would evoke in me as a is, is a bit more of a reflective quality you know so the, the the entrepreneur wants to grab and do and the philosopher wants to sit and contemplate at least with regards to how I I it shows up in me yeah and so the philosopher was somebody who was always doing but was always honoring the depth of uh, reflection and to be fair like I think many people carry that I think Peter Thiel types of people who are so philosophical and also entrepreneurial obviously there's so many Naval r r r you know Jacqueline Overgratz but I would say where for me philosophernership began was in the art studio mm -hmm. so for me as a painter that sense of working with material things paint and brush uh, guided by a sense of spiritual reflection. That, to me, is what a philosopher is. So when I look at what Andy Warhol does, or did, rather, with pop culture, with printed things, or um, uh, the, um, 
with the, with the fountain, um, Marce- Mar- Duchamp, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Duchamp. right. What he he did with recontextualizing material reality mm-hmm. is that so different than what Starbucks does recontextualizing chairs and tables and sound system and coffee beans into the Starbucks experience. Mm-hmm. I don't think so, you know. And even what Virgil Abloh did with the three percent tweak to a design to recontextualize it. I mean, that was his worldview, that was his philosophy. Mm. It was very relevant for the 2010s when we were bombarded by all of this inspiration. So for me, the artist, the artist, the sincere artist who is working with physical things as an artist, I think that feeling to me carries more of the philosopher mm. than either the philosopher does or the entrepreneur does, actually. Yeah, that's really interesting. I like that the, the material, the tools that come into play, um, and and how it, it it sort of dances with spirit, and and so I I, I want to ask like, how do you differentiate that that artist who who is now being seen as a philosopher? Um, is different from uh, a philosopher who is writing but sells their work. Yeah. Somehow, as you describe that, like recipes are coming to mind. So it's just like, you know, there can be an acai bowl, <laughs> you know, with some bananas and then there's extra peanut butter in there. Or that a same acai bowl could transform into like a sandwich, which has the peanut butter, the bananas, and a bit of acai, you know? Mm-hmm. But now there's bread there. So at the heart of it is the human spirit, I would say. You know, so if I had to, before I used to live in a completely multipolar world where there was like art and there's commerce and there's science and, you know, and they're all relevant, you know, like now I have a sense of actually maybe I'm just, this is my edge of exploration, that spirit comes first, you know, and um, all of these are just ways that we as spiritual beings like choose to show up, you know, you could have somebody who looks like a, uh, a priest and acts like a priest walks and talks like a priest but they're not a priest you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. and you can have someone who looks and acts and walks into like an investment banker but they're one of the holiest people you've ever met that's my belief you know mm-hmm. because I, I feel like what reality is is not in material or spirit it's in the alchemical fragrance or transmutation which each being is carrying out you know mm-hmm. so you could have a, a philosopher who never sells a business book who could still be the biggest business genius of their time. I believe that, you know? Maybe they're just this incredible branding expert genius. I mean, they don't even see themselves that way, but they are, you know? Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I like the way that you're thinking about it. Um, So then, you know, you mentioned a few people who you think are philosophers. I mean, you know, the Andy Warhol, Marcel Duchamp, Peter Thiel, Naval, Jacqueline Novogratz, um, what, what is it then that is different? I mean, they don't, they don't call themselves philosophers. Most of them, well, let, let's keep the artists aside. Let's say, you know, Peter Thiel or Jacqueline Novogratz most likely consider themselves just entrepreneurs. And, and so if we're if we're talking about this new notion of, of being a philosopher in the world, not just an entrepreneur, but a philosopher, what what how do you see that coming through and, and why? Why is this role important? Why not just be an entrepreneur? Why not just be a philosopher? Yeah. Why be a philosopher? Yeah. I know this is something I brought into your life, but um, you know, I think you've thought about it a lot. And, yeah. You know, and, and so I'm just very interested in, in um what you think yeah I think that's like probably one of the hardest questions you can ever ask today or in this moment you know obviously that's a huge question even for a a movement called philosopher it's like is there any even need for this or is um somehow music is coming to mind you know like like techno kind of came from disco right but then once you started to call it techno then a whole other way of thinking emerged. So I think you will find many artists, nonprofit, spiritual uh, thinkers, entrepreneurs, even just an employee who just works somewhere but is showing up with their full heart and mind. I think Ramdas Richard Alpert was a big proponent of showing up in the world with your spirituality, not 
negating and cutting everything out. So I think by giving the term and and finding the common DNA threads between all these different people in different you're starting to kindle a flame. Mm. And as that flame grows, you know, over time, people may become native natively a philosopher right from the get go. Once examples have been given. Many times books are like that, you know. All these books I used to read in college, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid or uh, C.K. Prahlad wrote about the social enterprise movement. I mean, basically these kind of books uh, are just finding a lot of examples of a theme, of a trend, and then giving it a term. And now the term, which previously was a bundle of loose sticks, is a solid foundation for something new. So you don't even know what philosopher is, of course, because there's a mystery. But by giving it a term, by doing your best to identify what it is, what it's not, and reflecting with people, uh, I do think there's a new kind of focus being created there. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where the meaning is. Yeah, I like that there's still a sense of uh, emergence. Like there's no real defined sense of what it means to be a philosopher. And uh, maybe the hope is that it just kind of seeps into society and, and everyone kind of creates their own sense of what it means to be a philosopher. But I think at the heart of it, it's the sense of like uh, deep critical thinking uh, matched with pragmatic actions, uh, you know, and, and commercially pragmatic actions. So, yeah, I, I appreciate your, your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just would like, there should be something that is at over time, like a, a certain, like, you know, colognes and perfumes use many of the same ingredients. So you can have a, a note like vanilla bean that shows up in this and that in Sauvage. I don't know what it's what all, you know, but but it's like there. But so it's in all these different forms, but there's still a key note there. Mm -hmm. So I think by it's it, it, when you're trying to integrate things, it's important to honor the parts. And so there is, I think, as you ask more people, what is philosophership or explore it yourself? I think there should be a sense over time, but whatever that definition is, I believe should be a post postmodern definition. It should not be so relative as the postmodern is, but there sh it should be more what we could call integral. I know we're searching for another term, but archetypes are like an integral or moving beyond the post postmodern. Cause if you take the archetype of, of beauty, you know, beauty can show up as a song, as a sound, as a sight, uh, beauty, but it's still beauty. Right. And so philosophernership can show up in this way in that way in that way, Everyone has their own participation with it, mm. but there's still some sense, at least within each individual heart, of like what it is. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I appreciate that. We want to move beyond that relativism, and maybe I, I think as you say that, I'm I'm thinking that uh, there's a deep care for civilization at the heart of what the philosopher okay. is doing is what's coming to mind. There's, I mean, entrepreneurship is, you know, there's, you're, you're always working with customers. So you are in, in some sense doing something for someone else. But a lot of the times we have people and there's nothing wrong with, with this notion of going into entrepreneurship because you want to make money. Obviously we all need to make money. We all need to make a living, but maybe there's a sense in which that the, the, the other is in front of the, this is in front of the self. So the self is, a little bit on the back seat. I'm not so sure, but um, there's a sense of like I thou in 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 the philosopher. It's like you're you're really now we we're reaching a point where, as a, as a species, we want to, you know, I, I I think put try to put an end to conflict. Do we really need to be in conflict anymore? I don't know. It's something to question, and um, and thus so the philosopher can start moving towards this towards this reality which is more whole which is more giving which is more peaceful so at the heart of the philosopher is 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 thinking about our species as a whole perhaps yeah that's really great it's great to hear you start to hash out for yourself you know it's like a, it's like listening to a song i mean the song has a clear presence but then you are dancing with the song, right? So it's like, what is philosophership or philosopher is a sound that each person resonates with on their own terms. I loved what you said about the uh, caring about society. The thing about the self, I would, 
question you I would ask you this question of can one not find the entire mm. cosmos through the self do you believe that's true or do you believe that that's that's not true yeah i i do believe that is true i think it's all really a mirror a reflection whatever uh i'm doing for my fellow uh human beings i'm doing for myself at the end of the day it's 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 all like a yeah it's a mirror it's a it's a reflection in many ways so i do think that so maybe there is no separation between the self and the other it's all just one thing um yeah i think this is a very deep avenue to go into like whether you know whether that is whether civilizational uh, intention is at the heart of what the philosopher does so thank yeah mm. thank you for for bringing that up i think it's something for me to continue to contemplate and also to act with yeah and yeah i think you know i just want to know uh in terms of your day to day activities like what what does a philosopher's day look like <laughs> well uh yeah i guess i could be uh considered somebody who is trying to be a philosopher or at least some part of me is so i do think that there is a part of that day which is for the self this guy Sean Covey as that his name wrote a book was it the 90s or 2000s called seven habits for highly effective people right one of these pop cultural sensations that a lot of people read 10 20 years ago <laughs> and i think habit 7 is like sharpening the saw right so was it abraham lincoln or washington who was like chopping down a tree and i don't know anyway there's the sense that if you're trying to chop down a tree and your axe is blunt it'll take you forever but if you sharpen it you spend 20 minutes sharpening it you can cut it down in the next mm. 40 minutes versus spending 2 hours 3 hours cutting it down so i think a lot a big part of every day not a big part but a meaningful part of every day should be towards one's deepest sense of what it means to be a human being which is a subset of being part of the cosmos you know so what does it mean to be of the cosmos i think is important so if one is just rolling out of bed right into your first meeting that's okay but then later in the day you know you should have room for whatever that edge is that you're always honing yourself these days for me meditation is a bigger thing before working out had that role there was times when reading was that painting was that but i think there's a role we play in society but then there's a larger reason we're here that's not so clear always but exploring that maybe it's doing the three pages of free association journaling that the woman from big magic i forget Elizabeth her name, Gilbert talks about i mean it's just so i i just think when you think philosopher nor like first what is your individual calling you know mm. or reason to be alive not even like destiny but just why are we here on this earth i think there may be a part of the reason we're here is to have spiritual evolution that's what i suspect that's part of it so i think that exploration should be there and then i think very intense and focused work should be there you know the pomodoro timer or just very deep work blocks you know mm. are important for me i work best when i get into a trance you know for me i mean i just when i really get into something give it time to warm up then deep meaningful work can happen mm. thank you thank you for that um yeah well i think you know that's that's really it from me i don't know if you have anything else you want to share or ask or yeah yeah uh no i i i think um yeah this is a uh, super interesting exploration that you're taking and uh Yeah, I look forward to um just hearing more of the philosophers you dialogue with and and more people's impression and sense of what it is. Um so yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. I I think we'll continue to have this kind of dialogue and uh I look forward to seeing um how it continues to unfold on 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 deeper and deeper levels. So thank you for joining me today, Abir, and thank you everyone for listening. 
See you next time.